gospel reading today is um, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to read 24 verses here. This uh, epistle is also the basis for our message this morning. In my Bible, it is uh, titled Unity and Maturity in the Body of Christ. We read. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given, as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. For they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learn when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. Let's join in a simple prayer that we sometimes pray together here at BCC, and it is this. Lord Jesus Christ, speak to me. Let's pray that aloud together. Lord Jesus Christ, speak to me. Amen. Well, I have a question for you. What is the largest living thing in our world? The sun. The largest single organism in our world. The sun. Well, the sun is not actually a living thing, and it's not in our world, so I can't take that answer. Mm -hmm. Some people might think a blue whale. Yeah. They're the biggest living animal. Some people might uh, suggest uh, a redwood tree, and uh, that would be a very, very large plant. But did you know that the largest single organism that has been discovered... Are going to raise that? There's a forest that's one tree. You're all, onto it. And all the roots go out to other trees, and all the trees are one tree, many by roots. This is it. Did you, did you 
This is called Pando. You look at that, and it looks like a forest. It's made up of more than 47,000 tree trunks. But they're all linked to one root system. As far as they know, this is the largest living thing, one single organism. The, uh, the tree keeps putting out roots from which grow more stems. It was suspected for many years that this, uh, that this forest was all one organism, but now with DNA, they're able to prove that it is. This is just one great big living thing. It is actually located, what, sorry? What kind of tree is it? It's an aspen tree. Aspen. It's called Pando. It's been given a name. P-A-N-D-O. You can look it up on the internet. There are some people that are concerned about the health of it and suggesting that it may actually be dying. It's thought to be very, very old. It's located on the southwest bank of Fish Lake in Utah. If you're ever down that way. Imagine that. 47,000 plus tree trunks with one root system. Wow. Below the surface, they're all linked by the root system. One single root system is keeping them all alive. The roots are unseen, but below the surface, they are all linked <coughs> together as one. Now I show you this picture of Pando today to illustrate how we as believers are all connected as one. Even in the face of challenges and difficulties, together we grow stronger. Now the last two weeks we talked about together we find peace and together we experience love. Today we explore another truth. Together we grow stronger. Yesterday we had a great example of working together. We built a shed out back here. And uh, there's uh, kind of the early stages of it, getting, uh, getting the floor put together. And uh, man, we had a crew of about a dozen guys. Some of them really knew what they were doing, some of us didn't, but we did our best. And uh, shout out to Connor and Triton. Those boys not only worked hard, but they know how to use tools. And uh, I don't know how many screws Connor put in yesterday, but I'll tell you what, it was a lot. He did a great deal of the work on that shed, and I guarantee you, it's not going to fall down. It might blow over, but it's not going to fall down. <laughs> Let's see what it looked like a little later on in the day. All right, there it is getting a little further along in the process. And again, a bunch of guys working together to accomplish something really significant. And I don't want to overlook the fact that several of the women of this church brought food for lunch. And I'm surprised that everybody didn't have to crawl off and take a sleep after they ate. I mean, that was one good lunch. So thank you, ladies. You know, as we study the church in Ephesus, that's the, the group to which the book the letter of Ephesians was written, we find that in some ways they were not too different from us. Those people lived in a fast-paced society. They were surrounded by competing religions and philosophies and people who had no faith at all. Paul, who is the writer, emphasizes the importance of coming together to understand and live out the story of Jesus. Now together we are discovering that Jesus can change our individual lives, and together we can change the world. Like the believers in the early church, we are committed to sharing life together. As we learn and grow together, we are becoming the kind of church that God wants us to be, a loving community, a community of love and peace and grace and impact. Now, we talked about the fact if you were here in the last two weeks, that the first three chapters of this little book of Ephesians outline God's plan of redemption 
and restoration, which is unfolding through history. How God brings human lives into a relationship with himself. Jesus Christ came into this world to make it possible for us to have a relationship with the God who created us. A relationship that's real and personal. Our faith in Jesus is intensely personal. But it is not intended to be individualistic. Together, as believers and followers, followers of Jesus, we experience his presence and his peace. Together we experience the love of God with others who love him too. And together we grow stronger as individuals and as a church body. So the first three chapters of Ephesians are explanation. The last three chapters are application. They tell us how the God story impacts our life story. Not only personally, but in our families, in our community, and in our world. Listen again to these words from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. As a prisoner of the Lord then, and remember, Paul was in, in jail when he wrote this, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. You know the famous prayer regarding patience, right? Lord, give me patience and make it quick. Um, <laughs> bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, Paul says, I like the word that is used in the King James Version, where it says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then. The KJV says, as a prisoner of the Lord, therefore. It kind of means the same thing. But the therefore, I think, is just a little stronger. And whenever I see a therefore in the Bible, I always look to see what it's there for. <laughs> That's a, an important uh, Bible study technique. Okay? <laughs> well, maybe it was intended. <laughs> okay. So, we look and see what it's there for. It's a transition. In, in light of the, the God story that he has just told us about and reviewed with us, he wants to tell us now how to live. He wants us to realize that it's Jesus who brings peace and love into our lives, and he wants us to share it with others. Today, we want to explore how his peace and love shape the way we live and the way we treat other people. We are to live lives worthy of the calling we have received. Earlier we sang about who we are in Christ. We become stronger together. Listen to these words again, verses 15 and 16 of Ephesians chapter 4. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. When Ruth and I lived in the state of Missouri, in the USA, we owned and operated a motorcycle dealership very close to the Mississippi River. In fact, we were probably about 100 yards from the edge of that mighty river. I'll tell you what, if you've never seen the Mississippi, it is one big river. It is. It makes the South Saskatchewan look pretty small. I know I've been on it. And uh, sometimes in the spring, that river floods and comes up over its banks and, uh, and becomes a mighty force that, that carries all kinds of things away. But you know, that river, which ultimately is more than a mile across, starts as a mere trickle of snowmelt that makes its way downhill 
joins together with others and becomes a stream, and then a river, and other rivers join in. Up uh, north of where we lived, just the other side of St. Louis, the I've been there. Uh, Missouri River joins in <laughs> Mississippi. And of course, at that point, um, the river gets a lot larger. You know, you've heard perhaps that the Mississippi is sometimes called the Big Muddy yeah. because it's a muddy river. It's actually the Missouri that makes the Mississippi muddy because up to that point, it's fairly clear. And then about, uh, about uh, 30 miles south of where we live, the Ohio River joins into the Mississippi. And at that point, the Ohio River actually dumps in twice the amount of water that's in the Mississippi already. So it triples the volume of that mighty river. It gets bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger till there's very little that can stand against the force. And uh, it's quite a thing to see uh, the barges coming up the Mississippi. Uh, they'll have uh, loads of coal or pulp or other large volume things. Um, and they, they move them with uh, tugboats. But they're not really tugboats because they're not tugging, they're pushing. And uh, some, some uh, barges are coming down river as others are going up. And uh, which one do you suppose has the right of way? When, uh, when they're coming down the channel, one's coming down, one's going up. The one coming down. The one coming down. You know, you would think that it was the one going up river because it's working harder, right? But in fact, it's the one coming down river that has the right, the right of way. Because when they're coming down, they have to keep those barges moving faster than the current, or they lose control. And it's easier to steer when you're going up. Mm. You use the yes, that's correct. Right. For sure. For sure, easier to steer going up. And every once in a while, a barge gets away and hits a bridge. And that's pretty exciting, too. <laughs> In the spring, like I say, that Mississippi River becomes a raging force of nature. I, I can remember in the spring of 2010, it flooded over. Now, I'll say this. The city of Cape Girardeau, where we live, had built a great flood wall. They built it high enough to make sure that the water would spill over on the Illinois side. <laughs> so, so we were okay right where we lived. But when you went across, it looked, the, the highway looked like a bridge that went on for miles because the, all of the land was flooded. And there were people who had their house on the highest point of land on their farm and uh, needed to use a boat to get back and forth between the highway and their doorstep. It's quite a thing to see. But my point is this, what made that water in that Mississippi River so powerful was the fact that it all came together. The water itself was no different than when it started way back up there as a trickle. But as the sources of water combine, the river grows in strength. There is power, there is strength in coming together. Or take the example of geese migrating south for winter. You know, a solitary goose can't make it alone. If a goose gets left behind, it can never catch up with the flock. Because as the geese fly in their famous V formation, the ones behind receive an uplift from the ones ahead. The stronger geese get up in front. And did you know that when the one at the point tires, he'll drop back and another goose will move up and take his place so that the whole flock can keep moving together. And those that are not as strong uh, take less time at the front or perhaps never fly up front at all. And you all know why when you see a V of geese, one arm is longer than the other, right? Yeah. Because there's more geese in it. <laughs> and so, with believers too, we are stronger together. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says, All the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. In the classic movie, The Sound of Music, 
Julie Andrews says, let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. So let's go for a moment back to Genesis chapter 1, the first book of the Bible, where God is doing his creative work. And we find that he creates a man. His name is Adam. And Adam is alone to begin with. And what does God say about that? God says, it is not good for him to be alone. And so God creates Eve, a companion for him. Now whether you are an extrovert or an introvert, you were created for relationship. We're all different. We all have different gifts, different talents and abilities. We are a very different people. But we use our unique talents and gifts to connect and to serve and to share God's love. As we build a community, as we fellowship together, we grow stronger. It's not simply a matter of filling more seats. We do keep an attendance record at church. We count people because people count. More people means more influence, more creativity, more compassion, more relationship, more support, more impact, more love. As I was preparing this message, I thought of an Old Testament passage, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verses 9 to 12, says, two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? We usually turn the thermostat at our house down for night. But last night I had to sleep alone, and I just left the thermostat where it was. <laughs> <laughs> Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And then, again, from Ephesians 4, 9 to 12. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Christ gave all these different people to build up the church. And that's not just talking about professional clergy here. This is talking about all of the people being given to the church so that together we build one another up. None of us has arrived yet. If you were a finished product, you would have gone to heaven by now. None of us has attained the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. But that is our goal. It is a journey of transformation, and we are making it together. All of us need to work together so that the body of Christ will be built up to accomplish God's work in our world. Verses 4 to 6 of our study chapter says, There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Who is over all and through all and in all. You could say that the message today is being brought to you by the number one. Alright? There's just one body. There's one Lord. The body is a perfect metaphor for the idea of oneness. The individual parts of our human bodies work together so that we can function. Romans 12, 5 says, So in Christ we, though many, <coughs> form one body, and 
Each member belongs to all the others. In Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Together as a body, we become stronger. That is why it is not enough to pray alone in the woods or sing songs in the shower or listen to sermons on podcasts or TV. Now those are all good things, but we need to be together physically, mentally, emotionally, regularly. The church is people coming together and growing together. I want to say a word about change. Growth always means change. And change can be hard at times, but it goes hand in hand with growth. You know, the neuroscientists used to think that our thoughts shape our actions. And certainly there is some truth in that. But they are increasingly discovering that our actions shape our thoughts. If you perform an action repeatedly, it gets hardwired into your brain. So here's a principle that I want you to, to remember. It is easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than it is to think your way into a new way of acting. Mm -hmm. Do you get that? Yes. It is easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than it is to think your way into a new way of acting. This helps us to understand how we can change and grow. In order to control our thoughts and our attitudes, we need to control and change our actions. As a body of believers, we choose to act in faith and obedience to God regardless of our feelings. Together we grow stronger as we trust God and do the next right thing. Step by step, we will see God bring real growth and lasting change in our lives, in our church, and in our world. You know, the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. You know, iron can only sharpen iron if those two pieces of iron get together. Right? It only works when there's togetherness. Ephesians 4, verses 22 to 24. Let's listen to this one more time. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God, in true righteousness and holiness. And Paul goes on then to talk about the things that need to change. He says, no more anger. No more stealing, no more unwholesome talk, no more bitterness, no more rage. <coughs> Instead, those things are replaced by kindness, compassion, forgiveness, and gratitude. You see, the thing about growth is that it's often slow because it's a process. You know those kids that are down in junior church right now? If you see them every Sunday, they look pretty much the same. You don't notice that they're growing. But think for a moment about the, uh, the kids, maybe, maybe some of your relatives, that you only see once a year. Yeah. And when you see them, what do you say? Oh my goodness, have you ever grown? Well, obviously, the kids you see regularly are growing in the same way. But you don't see it. Because you're so involved and so close to the process. 
Kids don't look much different from one day to the next or one week to the next. You see them a year later and wow, have they changed. And the same is true for us as individuals and as a church. As a church, we must commit to the good habits that bring positive change. While at the same time realizing it is the Holy Spirit of God that gives us the desire and the courage and the power to change. <coughs> Next Sunday, we will all have an opportunity to join a life group. A group that will meet together in a home for eight weeks. A big part of this is the getting together part, sharing life. We'll do some study. We'll certainly do some praying together. But that togetherness is such an important part. And I want you to really give serious, prayerful consideration to being a part of a life group. This church is never going to be perfect. Actually, if it was, you couldn't be a member anyway. No. The church is never going to be perfect. Because it's made up of imperfect people. We acknowledge it, but we don't use it as an excuse. We won't settle for being less than what God wants us to be. Together, by God's grace, and with the help of His Holy Spirit, we are growing stronger. Let's recommit ourselves today to the work and change of growth for Jesus' sake. Let's sing our closing song. <coughs>